Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Crime and Punishment, written by Hicks Kem. Captain Jarrell sat calm before the assembled council, nodding to each of them in turn as they took their seats. The surrounding chamber was filled to capacity with spectators who had all gathered to witness the proceedings. Captain Jarrell, I will first inform you that this court-martial is in regards to the act of unsanctioned execution that occurred on your ship approximately three cycles ago. Do you have any question as to the incident in which I am referring? Jarrell leaned forward to speak clearly into the recording device. I know of the incident, and I am prepared to continue. Captain Jarrell, you stand accused of executing an individual aboard your ship without granting that individual due process of law. You are also charged with the crime of interspecies execution outside of formal declaration of war. Do you understand these charges? Jarrell nodded again. I do, Prime Counselor. This council understands that you have waived your rights to legal advocacy in these proceedings. Is that also correct? It is, Prime Counselor. Very well, Captain. We shall proceed. How do you plead to the charges laid before you? I plead guilty with condition, Prime Counselor. The chamber filled with muttering for several seconds. Most of the assembled expected the captain to plead not guilty and offer a defense. The counselor tapped on the console to his right, and a gentle ringing tone filled the chamber. The chatter died down quickly. Let the record reflect intent to plead guilty upon acceptance and adherence to the conditions as follows. Please, captain, name your conditions. I wish to explain the full detail of my actions leading to the actions before this council. More muttering filled the room. The council finds these conditions to be acceptable, and will now hear your recounting of these events. Jarrell stood from his seat and bowed. Thank you, councillors. I will begin with our entry into star system 4527. Local name, Sol. On or about 1.22.94.4772. My vessel was an observer-class vessel equipped with some of the latest and greatest scanning tech to come from the core world. One of the newest scientists, a screese by the name of Lottie, had filed a request early on in the mission to make a closer pass through the region of 4527-3, local name Earth. I considered his request and looked at the charts we had. I deemed it to be safe enough for scanning so long as we maintained cloak and kept the satellite body 4527-3.1, Luna, between us and the planet. He had requested that we hold position for 10 to 12 rotations. I resumed, to my own fault, that he intended to use the time to comparatively scan and resolution refinement. Earth is, after all, still in need of additional study. As soon as we were in position behind Luna, Lottie set to work. I attended to other concerns aboard the ship for a rotation also, then returned to inquire as to the progress of his observations. When I entered his lab, I saw something on the table. Heavily restrained, Lottie was speaking to a recorder as he poked at it. One of the counselors spoke up. Captain Jarrell, at this time had any authorizations been made to gather samples of biomatter from the planet? Jarrell shook his head. No, counselor. I had already familiarized myself with the briefing material on the primary sapient in the region, Cubans and had instructed the crew that there would be no interactions with the species unless absolutely necessary. Anyway, Lottie was making audio notes, and I didn't think much of it until I heard what he was saying. This specimen is significantly smaller in size and mass than reports from other species would indicate, suggesting that they recalibrate their measuring instrumentation. This concerned me, as there should have been no specimens of any kind of bond. As I approached... I heard him continue. Specimen is holding what appears to be the corpse of another predator creature from the planet, though it also appears to be drastically smaller than reports. I am inclined to wonder if previous reports on the size of creature, the so-called death world, are even remotely plausible. If he had brought a specimen on board, and it was holding the corpse of a predator, it was exceedingly dangerous. The Prime Counselor interrupted. When he mentioned a death world... To what is he referring? A death world is a common term for a class 9 biohazardous planet. 
To my knowledge, System 4527.3 is the only recorded case of a Class IX planet producing a species capable of expanding into stellar space. Thank you for clarifying, Captain Jarrell. Please continue. Jarrell paced as he carried on. I approached the workbench and demanded to see what Lottie was working on. What I saw shook me to my core. He told me very plainly that he had acquired a specimen of the dominant species as well as the corpse of one of their lesser predators. The translator indicates that it has repeatedly requested a female progenitor and a young canine predator, but it does not seem to possess any of the reported ferocity of its species. I have half a mind to demand a retraction of every published paper on the species. Oh, Captain, this will make waves in the scientific communities. He seemed so thrilled with himself and so utterly unaware of what he had done. I asked how he had acquired the specimen. He told me that he had transported very precisely to a remote region with low population density and had, under the cover of darkness, acquired the specimen. When I pressed him for details, he seemed to think I was asking for a tale of bravado that I might congratulate him over. Well, I entered quietly, using vibration dampeners, put the small canine down with a disruptor, and acquired the specimen as it hibernated under a plant fiber-based insulator. I will admit that my actions were driven by fear at this point. Fear and rage. I remember shaking a bit. I asked him if he had read the briefing reports of the system. He'd said he glanced at them. I asked if he'd read anything about human larvae, and he admitted to me that the reproductive cycle of the humans was outside the scope of his work. Let me explain this to you clearly, I said to him. You have just informed me that you stole the human child, shot his dog, and are now attempting to perform experiments on him. He looked surprised. This cannot be a child, my dear captain. Look, he is holding the corpse of another predator. What child of any species would bring down another predator? I was dumbfounded. That is a teddy bear, I said. It is the mark of a child human that still nests with the adults. I issued a red alert and had our medical staff administer both a sedative and an amnesiac to the human, then transported it back to its habitat. They used dosages that would have been lethal to any of my crew, mind you, but they were still only 80% certain that the drugs would be sufficient to register as a dream state for the human child. As for Lottie, he showed no understanding of the severity of his actions and expressed a desire to find additional specimens to study. At this time, counselors, I determined Lottie to be a clear and present danger, not only to my ship and crew, but also to the galactic conglomeration as a whole. I sentenced him to death, carried out the sentence, ordered an immediate abort of the mission, and relinquished command of my vessel to my first officer. The chamber exploded with noise as Captain Jarrell resumed sitting. After a brief deliberation, the Prime Chancellor rose. Captain Jarrell, this council has considered your testimony with the additional review of the acquired Earth documents regarding the theft of a human larvae and the assault of a familiar canines. We find that your actions were unavoidable, necessary, and within the bounds of reason. We thank you for your efforts to avoid awakening the human homeworld, and we have decided to reject your guilty plea. End of story. Story number two. On the classification of worlds. Written by Ark Demon Korinsky. Excerpts from a lecture series on planetary morphology and habitability index by Professor Exnal of the Italian System University. Excerpts provided for free up to the immediate familiar unit use. Please purchase entire series. There are four classifications currently used to designate types of planetary bodies. Garden, rough, death, special. There used to be a greater number but the other classifications have been combined into the special category due to their general rarity and lack of common use. Each planetary body has an alphanumeric designation that allows anyone familiar with the system to understand the vast majority of features that can be found on it. An example of this is X00XXX-XX. The first digit is the overall classification GRD or S. I assume that any student capable of meeting the prerequisites for this class can figure out which means which. The next two numeric digits are from 1 to 10. 
These indicate the overall danger presented by the local conditions, as calculated by the Rexlent Unified Index. The higher the number, the greater the danger present. While I will not go into the math required to use the index, I will say that it is a logarithmic scale. Accepting S classification, G, R, D planets are sequential. That means that an R01 world is the same thing as a G11 and so on. Yes, you will lose points if you call something a G11 on a test. The next three digits relate to the indigenous life on the planet. First represents the complexity of life. M, organic micromolecules. S, single-celled organisms. P, polycellular organisms. C, complex multicellular organisms. List truncated for excerpt. The second digit relates to the compositional structure of the indigenous life. C. Carbon base. S. Silicate base. H. Sulfur based. List truncated for excerpt. Third digit is reference to primary atmosphere composition. Much like the Rexland Unified Index, this can be confusing. So please pay attention when studying these designations. R. Primary noble gases, followed by nitrogen. J. Primary iodine, followed by xenon. F. Primary nitrogen, followed by oxygen. List truncated for excerpt. The next set of digits are a reference to the system the planet resides in. These call attention to notable, usually dangerous features of the system. These can be Q. Asteroid fields. W. Magnetic disturbances. D. Orbit irregularities. List truncated for excerpt. Special glass planets use the same format for designation, though the digits can mean something different. The numeric digits represent the ease of terraforming, calculated using the Rexland Terraforming Index. The next digit represents the category of planet. Z. Rocky body. V. Gaseous body. G. Frozen body. List truncated for excerpt. Second digit is primary elemental composition in solid or liquid form, complementing the next digit which remains gaseous composition. F. Iron with vanadium and tungsten. G. Aluminium with chromium and bromine. List truncated for excerpt. System designation digits remain unchanged. T000 is a designation appended to the end of the standard string used for special class planets that are currently undergoing terraforming, representing the percentage of terraforming that had been completed. Upon reaching 100%, the planet designation will be modified to represent its new GRD status. The university, and the professor in particular, would like to thank the Exo Explorer Corps of Humanity for their incalculable assistance in providing the first and only hands-on data collection for the Planetary Census and the Registration Commission. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just quickly like to give thanks to our tier 5 members. Elithia, Barky, Feudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albarden Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Lord Azrakal.